Welcome to the Indianola First Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our prayer is that this message will inspire you, encourage you, and launch you into life-changing action. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be here today. It's good to see a full house in church. Amen. It's not even Easter Sunday, so I guess being a creaster is just not a, a stylish thing to do anymore, right? Do you know what a creaster is? It means you attend Christmas and Easter only. We call those creasters lovingly because we're glad they're here, right? <laughs> so glad to have you here today, and we're so glad to be here in God's house. And, and uh, man, just to worship and praise like you were. You know, sometimes up here we can't hear what's going on because you're singing so loud. <laughs> And I love it. It's like, we don't need to be heard. Let's just let the praises roar. Amen? Well, we have been in a series for quite some time. We took a little break, actually, for Easter and Palm Sunday. But I want to jump back into this series that we've entitled The Third. And really, it's, it's just a series on the Holy Spirit. Who is he? What are some of his characteristics? Uh, and just kind of going through the beginning of the Bible all the way through and talking about this person, this most important person of, of the Holy Spirit. I mean, he is God, right? Amen. He is part of the uh, one true Godhead. And we, uh, we uh, uh, have been doing this about seven weeks. And, um, you know, especially as we approach Pentecost Sunday which you might not know this, but Pentecost Sunday is always seven weeks after Easter. Seven weeks, which is how many days, mathematicians? How many days? Well, seven weeks is how many days? It's 49 days, but you count Easter Sunday as the day, so it's 50 days, right? So 50 days from Easter is Pentecost Sunday, and that's May 23rd this year, but we are, uh, we've been talking again about the Holy Spirit and who he is, and so far we've looked at the role that this third member of the Trinity has played throughout the history of time as recorded in the scriptures. So first of all, we, we covered the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna do a quick review here really fast, so, so turn on your, uh, get your pens out, get your pencils out, get your phones out, ready to type. If you don't have this already, you can go back and watch online some of the services that we've had on this, but I think this has been a really productive study and it's going to really play out that we've laid the foundations for what's going to come in the next few weeks. Because now, like I told the staff earlier this week, uh, now is we're, we're just getting into the really good stuff about the Holy Spirit. And um, uh, we've looked at the, the role of the third person of the Trinity, third member of the Trinity, as, as played throughout the history. The Holy Spirit is God, number one. It's God, he's God. He is God. He's the third member. Um, one God, three distinct, distinct personalities, right? One God, three distinct personalities. And that's sometimes misunderstood a little bit because people go, well, that, just mean, that means there's three gods. No, there's one God. We believe in one God. How many gods do we believe in? How many gods do we believe in? How many gods do we believe in? One, but he has three distinct. He manifests himself in three distinct personalities and the third is usually referred to as the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. So he's one God, three personalities, three parts. The original Hebrew word for the Holy Spirit is ruach. I love speaking Hebrew because you get to do that. Ruach. ruach. Everybody say ruach. And it's important you know that when, when you see that word in the original Hebrew or you see the word spirit in, in the English version in the Old Testament, it's almost always translated spirit, that word ruach, or wind, or breath. The Holy Spirit had an active role in God's act of creating all things. He's always existed and he always will. He's God. He has all the characteristics of God. And we've seen that he's creative, he's protective, he prepares, he's gentle. He's consistently wooing us back into a relationship with God. And we see also that he brings judgment upon sin and his enemies. Kind of two sides there, right? But he's all of those things. He uses people. He comes upon them. He anoints them. He gave the 12 different judges of the Bible incredible abilities to carry out the will of God. And he gave the prophets of the Old Testament the ability to speak the very words of God to the people. And we've also gone over how he played an active role in the life and ministry of Jesus. The Holy Spirit was a part of Jesus' ministry, church. 
In the Greek, the word for the Holy Spirit is hagios pneuma. If you want to speak Greek, just say that. Hagios pneuma. Well, some of you don't want to say it. But what's cool about that is that word in the Greek, it opens up meaning, and the holy, which is really defined awful. Holy, awful. Well, that doesn't sound right, does it? Full of awe. Holy, full of awe. The holy, awe-inspiring spirit of the living God. That's who we're talking about. And just before Jesus was, Jesus was tested in the wilderness, the Holy Spirit empowered him, came upon him at his baptism. We know that to be true. And in this series, we also covered different ways in which we sin against the Holy Spirit, including even the blasph blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. We talked about the importance of understanding that Jesus was and is fully God, but he did not use those rights and abilities as God when he walked on this earth. He wanted us to be, an, he wanted to be an example to us in how we are supposed to operate. And he said that we would do even greater works than he did because we too would have access to the power of the Holy Spirit. So this morning I wanna get into the access part. That's what we've covered. I went over that very quickly, but I want to get into the access that we have to the Holy Spirit as believers. So let's start with John 20, 21 through 22. This is happening on the day of, of Jesus' resurrection, okay? And so Jesus said to them again, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, he breathed on them, and said, receive the Holy Spirit, the Hagios Pneuma. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So here we see Jesus appearing to his disciples after his resurrection. It was, the, it, was, it was the same day that he was resurrected. It was later that evening. And he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Then he breathes on them and says, receive ye the Holy Spirit. This is a pivotal moment, church. It's a pivotal moment in history. This is the beginning of something that set the tone and the pace of the church from, from that day till this day. And you have to understand, these disciples were followers of Jesus, but their relationship with Jesus was different than our relationship is with him. Up until this moment, they only knew him prior to the cross, prior to his death and resurrection. Prior to his death and resurrection, no, nobody had ever died and gone to heaven. Do you understand that? Before Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected on that Easter Sunday, nobody before that went to their eternal home. It just didn't happen because the price had not been paid yet. And upon dying, we know that Jesus went to Hades and he set the captives free. And we know from other scripture that those with faith who believed before Christ was walking the face of the earth, that faith was accredited to them as righteousness and allowed them to be a part of what the scriptures call paradise. But it wasn't heaven. It wasn't their eternal resting place. Heaven couldn't be attained by any person until the price had been paid and death itself was defeated. That's just the facts. And Jesus breathed on them and he said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. His disciples experienced the Holy Spirit being deposited in them a lot like it came upon so many before them. So here's the deal. It was different. It was different in the sense that this would not just be a one-time thing or a for-the-moment kind of thing. This was a deposit that was made within them that was a lasting deposit. And from this point on, anyone who called upon the name of the Lord, anyone who received the Lord Jesus into their heart, anyone who laid it all down at the altar and accepted the forgiving power of Jesus in their life would have the same deposit made within them. It's the very reason that uh, uh, salvation in him changes us from the inside out. Maybe Jesus was alluding to this when he said, you blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and, and the plate, that the outside may also be clean. See, the Holy Spirit 
deposited within you the hagios pneuma, the holy, awe-inspiring spirit of God, God himself lives in you. You got to get a hold of this. But because before the cross, before the resurrection, that was not true. The Holy Spirit would come on individuals for certain times and moments as we covered. But this was a pivotal moment. Jesus breathed on them, and all of a sudden, they experienced being born again like we experienced being born again because the Holy Spirit was deposited in them. And every person since that moment, every person that calls upon the name of the Lord has the Holy Spirit deposited within them. God, the third personality of the, of, of, of the Trinity, the third person of of the triune God, the one true God, lives inside of every believer. Do you see the difference of coming upon versus deposited inside? It's pretty amazing. And we get to live on this side of the cross and this side of the resurrection. And when we accept Christ, that deposit is made. On the night that he was betrayed and handed over to be crucified, Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The word helper here is the Greek word paraclete or parakletos. And listen to the definition of this word, helper. This is how Jesus described the Holy Spirit. One who is summoned, one who is called to one side, called to one's aid, one who pleads another's cause before a judge, a pleader, a counsel for defense, a legal assistant, an advocate, an intercessor. That's who we have living on the inside of us. Helper is a correct definition in the English of parakletos, but it doesn't really do it justice. The Holy Spirit that was deposited inside each of us when we accepted Christ as our helper, the one who was summoned by Christ himself to come alongside us and give us aid. I love that. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and he has been summoned to bring aid to us in our time of need. The Holy Spirit pleads our cause before the judge, who is God the Father. He is our defense counsel, our advocate. He intercedes on our behalf. Did you know you had a defender living on the inside of you? A defender, a helper. One who has been summoned to give you aid. A comforter. John 14, 15 through 18 says, If you love me, and this is Jesus speaking, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. The very thing that Jesus promised his followers as he spent his last evening with them, because this was happening right after they had shared the Passover meal. He was speaking all these things to them. And it's the same thing that every person receives when they accept Christ. It's the deposit of his Holy Spirit. This is the evidence of your salvation, the Holy Spirit within you. And what does he do for you? Well, John 16, 8 says, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And John 16, 13 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of you leads you into all truth if you listen if you pay attention he will take you to a place of truth he'll guide you through and as i as i was reading this and picturing this i'm thinking about um uh 
walking through like a, 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 a wilderness or, or, or some, my, my, only, my only kind of connection to that would be deer hunting. Got any deer hunters in here today? No? I like to kill deer and I like to eat deer. And I don't have anything against PETA, but to me it means, you know, people eating tasty um, animals. So, I, I like to eat wild game. I like it. It's good stuff. I don't like poaching and I don't like killing things for sport, but there is a sport to going out and, and uh, respectfully taking the life of an animal and then eating it. I mean, I got some deer jerky that is so good. My mouth's watering. I love Iowa deer because it's corn fed. I mean, how is that different than your burger? Your beef burger. It's delicious. Anyway, I'm getting off the track. But as I'm deer hunting and you're going through the briar patches and the thorns and all the stuff that you got to go through and, and you got to have thick clothing on because those, those thorns are, are big and they'll, they'll get you. And I'm thinking about Okay, you're, you're, you're navigating through this, right? You're, you're trying to find the best, easiest path, the path of least resistance, right? And as you do that, as you do that, hopefully you're not going to get caught because you can kind of lead yourself right into a, stick, a stickery place, we'll call that. And you just, you can't even move and you come out of it finally and you're all full of cuts and pokes and all sorts of stuff, and then some of those, some of those uh, thorns and, and stuff, they, they, uh, they, they swell up on your arm when they poke you and all that. How many have ever experienced that stuff? Okay, you know what I'm talking about? And you're like, why would you ever go deer hunting then? <laughs> because the meat is that good, right? It's been a long time since I've really gotten to hunt, but um, I need to make it a point this year to go hunting. So Dennis, where are you, Dennis? Are you here today? Dennis, you make sure I go hunting this year, okay? It's your job. I set it from the pulpit, you make sure I go, right? And you set me in a nice place where I can kill deer really easy. All right, thank you. And eat them, yeah. But you navigate through all this nasty stuff. You try to get through it and you hope you weren't. Here's the deal. In life, we have to go through a lot of nasty, stickery places. Places that aren't fun. Places where you, you can get beat up and bruised and poked and prodded and all these things. And we all know we go through stuff like that, right? The Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you through all of it. He will defend you. He will lead you into all truth. He's your advocate. He's the one who's been summoned to come to your aid and guide you through the stickery places of life. That's who we have living on the inside of us. In church, let me be as blunt as a spoon. Most of us ignore him because we try to do it ourselves. Why? Why do we do that? When he, when Jesus himself died on a cross and said, I must go so that you can have the benefit of this helper, this advocate, this comforter, this defender. Before the cross and resurrection, the disciples were with Jesus. Because of the cross and resurrection, the disciples and all true disciples since then have the Holy Spirit, and it's really the Holy Spirit of Jesus, living inside of them. It was a game changer that day when he breathed on them. John 20, 21 through 22. I've already read this, but I'm going to read it again. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. This is resurrection day. This is later in the evening after he rose from the dead. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I've already read that scripture to you this morning, but it's important that you understand the next verse. 
It says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. That's one of those weird sayings in the Bible that people go, hmm, I wonder what that means. I mean, what in the world did Jesus mean by this? Because it would be easy to assume a, at first glance uh, that, that because the Holy Spirit now resides in us, that we have some kind of authority to forgive people's sins or, or to not forgive their sins. Don't be confused. We, we don't have that kind of authority. We can't forgive someone's sins unto salvation. That's God's authority. That's his business. That belongs to him, that authority. But verse 23, which is, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from them, it is withheld. That verse can only be understood if you remember the second part of verse 21b, which says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. This was Jesus speaking. Don't miss this. Jesus brought the good news of the gospel to the world. He brought the new covenant. Jesus brought the message that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And that word believe carries with it the idea of absolute trust. So just as Jesus brought the gospel of reconciliation between God and man, we, with the Holy Spirit of Jesus inside us, bring that same message of reconciliation to a lost and dying world around us. If we preach that gospel as we have been sent and commanded by the Lord to do so, then sins will be forgiven, not by us, but by God. If we, do, if we do not preach the gospel, sins won't be forgiven. See, there's a command here in these verses that says you need to go out and preach the gospel that you've been given. It's our job. We have a responsibility if we've accepted the gift that he so freely gave us to share what we've been given. Amen? Amen. And we know that from all sorts of other scriptures that we could get into today. But here it is again in the midst of this stuff. I think it's interesting that it's right in the midst of of, of the, the whole breathing the Holy Spirit into them. As Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit... Think about this. Again, the next words out of his mouth are in reference to preaching the heart of the gospel, the forgiveness of sins. In other words, if Jesus is going to deposit the Holy Spirit in you, and it's a wonderful and glorious thing, it's great to have the helper. We need the comforter. We need our defender. Our intercessor, but as wonderful as all that is, as all that is, it is also expected of us to share it. It's not something that you can contain when it really gets a hold of you. Can I? I sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm I'm too blunt. But Christians who are quiet with their faith, those who consider their personal relationship with Jesus just a, a, a private matter, they haven't read the Gospels. These disciples were killed for it later. Where is our unction to share it? I mean, if the Holy Spirit's been deposited in us to lead us into all truth, to guide us, to be our defender in all things, and we're supposed to go out and preach the gospel, the next words out of Jesus' mouth after he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit, is go and preach the forgiveness of sins to people so that they can be forgiven, so they can have what you have, then why do we be quiet about it? Why do we ever shut up about it? We shouldn't. We should be talking about it all the time. It should just be flowing out of us. When's the last time you put your reputation on the line for the gospel? Ooh, that would be hard. Well, these guys didn't put their reputation on the line. They put their life on the line. I heard a story recently of a missionary uh, who went to a very large country that we owe a lot of money to. (laughs) And he went to this country to meet with other pastors from that country of the indigenous church there, the underground church there. And as he was there, they had to travel days just to get to this place where they could have a meeting and encourage one another and pray. 
And as they were, as they were, they were meeting, uh, uh, the, the missionary became curious because he was, he was uh, uh, from America. And he just said, he said um, to them, what would happen if we were caught right now? And they said, well, you would be deported immediately and everything you own that you have here, would, you would lose. We would be thrown into jail for two years minimum for meeting. This is today's time. And as they were praying, they started praying for freedom. They wanted freedom to worship and to share the gospel and freedom within their governmental system to, to, to be open with their faith. And one of the, the, the pastors from that country said to the missionary, let's pray that we could be more like America. And the missionary cried. He goes, I will not pray that. Because in America, no one would travel four days to go to a meeting where they could possibly put, be put in jail for the gospel. You people are the real deal, and I'll pray that America becomes more like you in your faith. Now that's a little hard-hitting. I love freedom. I'm not dissing our freedom. But freedom's fragile, folks. It's very fragile. It can be gone like that. Where will, your, where, where will your faith be at that moment? We gotta be ready to share, ready to talk about this stuff. Jesus then appeared to his disciples over the next 40 days before he ascended into heaven. Acts 1.3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering many, by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So he taught them things over the next 40 days. And so sometime during those 40 days, after the resurrection, and after he had breathed on the disciples and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit, he told them this. Now, this is very important. Acts 1, 4 through 5. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What's the promise of the Father? It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So isn't it amazing that Jesus gives them the Holy Spirit on the day of his resurrection? He breathes on them, says, receive ye the Holy Spirit, which they received, which he defined himself as the promise of the Father. And then he says sometime in the 40 days after that, that they must wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. It's like, uh, didn't they just get that when he breathed on them? Yes, they did. But he was now telling them that the deposit of the Holy Spirit within them was just the beginning. The promise of the Father would be completely fulfilled when Jesus himself would baptize them in, the, in his Holy Spirit. And remember, to baptize is to dip or to fully immerse. So what Jesus was saying was that even though they had the Holy Spirit at this point, in a very short time, they would experience something more, an immersion in the Holy Spirit, a total saturation of of the Holy Spirit. Had a great look at what baptism is last week. 32 people baptized right there in that baptismal. And I don't know if that got you excited. It got me excited. Because that represents lives changed. And when they went down in the water, they went all the way because that's the true meaning of the word baptize. To dip, to immerse, to go all the way under, to be saturated by it. And they came up out of the water and guess what? They were soaking wet. There wasn't any part of them that was dry. When Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Spirit, you will be immersed in the Holy Spirit, totally saturated by it, no, not, not just deposited in you. That would be enough, wouldn't it? It's enough to go to heaven for sure. We know that it's a, such a gift to have it deposited within us at, the, at that moment of salvation. We know it's there. We know he leads us and guides us and does all those great things for us. He's our advocate. He's our defender. But then he goes on to say, I will soak you in it. I will baptize you in it. I'll immerse you in, not just it, but in him. I shouldn't have said it, him, the Holy Spirit. 
I will baptize you in him. Woo. I came from South Dakota and I thought they were the frozen chosen. It's cold up there, right? That should get us excited, folks. I know we don't have a lot of emotion in Iowa, you know, we're sort of just chill, right? He promised he's going to immerse you in the third person of the Godhead, saturated by the Holy Spirit. Can I talk slower for you? Do I need to get out my crayons to tell you what that means? I'm not trying to insult anybody, but do you know how good that is? That we can be saturated in the Holy Spirit? Absolutely dripping wet. No part of us without the Holy Spirit. Dipped, dunked, immersed. Oh, man. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> we should do a sermon sometime, Jared, on the different ways people respond in different parts of the country. I think it's hilarious. Because in some parts of the country, running around the room going, Rah! in Iowa, the same thing as that, the equivalent to that is, whoo. So. <laughs> and that's okay, because God knows our heart, right? So instead of running all over the room and going crazy, let's just do, woo. All right, there you go. <laughs> We're going to end right there this morning. And that's where I'm going to start next Sunday. The, yeah. <laughs> now you know what I'm talking about. As we used to say on the farm, you're smelling what I'm stepping in. Can you say that from the pulpit? I just did. I'm going to start there next Sunday. These promises and the fulfillment of these, of, of these promises were not just for the disciples back then. They're for us today. And we are still on this side of the cross. We're, we're on this side of the resurrection, church. What a great time to live. You know, with everything going on in the world, this is the best time to live ever. It's exciting. Let me challenge with you, you with this today. I'm going to take you back to the word that Jesus used to describe his Holy Spirit. Paraclete or parakletos. One who is summoned, called to one side. One who is called to, to one's aid. One who pleads another's cause before a judge. A pleader, counselor for defense, legal assistant, an advocate, an intercessor. How many times, let me ask you this, how many times do we try to fix things ourselves? We defend our positions, we plead our own cases, but when we live according to the Holy Spirit, he's going to do all that for us so that we don't have to. As we walk and live in the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, deposited there as a sign that we have been saved, he fights our battles for us. And we all have battles. He leads us into all truth. He is our heavenly defender. You gonna mess with me? I mean, we can all say that. Devil, you're gonna mess with me? With whatever it is that's being thrown at us, you're gonna mess with me? Because I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. And I don't have to defend nothing. He is going to fight my battle for me. He is my comforter. He is my legal assistant, my legal counsel. And I'm telling you, no matter what it is you're going through, if you understand that, when it hits you and come up, comes up against you, it hits a brick wall of our helper who lives on the inside of us. And it can do no damage because it hits that brick wall of the Holy Spirit, if you can put it that way. <laughs> oh, 
oh gosh, I started something. (laughs) He is our heavenly defender. I want you to think about that this week. And I want you to begin to pray and seek God. Pastor Jared's right. We're going to have a, we're going to have a, sur- or a prayer service this Wednesday where we're just going to seek God and get on our faces before him. We'll intermix it with some singing. Um, what do they call that? Harp and bowl kind of worship and prayer. Is that what they call that? Did I say that right? Yeah. Um, but anyway, they, we, we are going to have some, a, a time, and especially a time of praying for others. But part of that prayer is going to be in preparation for next Sunday when we talk about the immersion because I believe that, that some people in this place need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit again. They need a refreshing. Some of you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit for the first time. Woo! <laughs> Beat me to the punch. Yeah! <laughs> we need that. And if it's available to us, why not partake? Let's pray. I just feel led to do this this morning. I, Brad Money, are you, I don't see you out there. Are you here? I heard your voice. Oh, there you are. You're wearing black. I can't see in the dark. Would you come up and just close us in prayer today? And when he's done praying, you can say, Woo! All right. <laughs> Love you guys. We'll see you Wednesday. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray and we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together and worship you and serve you, Lord Jesus, and we pray that you would lift us up this week. Fill us with your spirit, Father. Keep us safe and keep us strong and give us the the confidence to speak out with your spirit, Lord, to share it with those around us and to be your voice and to be your heart when we interact with others, Lord, that may not know you, that to such a degree that they would see something on us and wonder what that is. Why is this guy so nice? Why is this gal so nice? Why are they not affected by by this? How are they walking so strong in in this? So, Lord, just lift us up and, and lift up everybody here. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being a part of the Indianola First podcast. Join us next week to stay updated on our latest messages.